So instantaneous wave free ratio, we are going to measure the PDPA only, but you don't need hyperemia, which means you don't need adenosine here. But how will you tell whether this is really important or not, whether this is really significant or not? Because we are going to measure the PDPA, not randomly. some idea about whether to do a PCA or not. So that is where your instantaneous wave free ratio becomes really important. So instantaneous wave free ratio, we are going to measure the PDPA only, but you don't need hyperemia, which means you don't need adenosine here. But how will you tell whether this is really important or not, whether this is really significant or not? Because we are going to measure the PDPA, not randomly, we are going to measure at a specific point in the pulse waveform called as a wave-free period. So wave-free period is a very specific, uh, I mean, area in the diastolic pulse wave. So where your coronary blood flow will be at its maximum in the entire cardiac cycle. At the same time, there will be absolutely no competing waves from any of the other systemic vessels like aorta. No competing waveforms. So it's all about the coronary blood flow and the coronary circulation only. So that's what we called as a wave-free period. So to understand where is the wave-free period, even though it's not important for exams at any cost, because the machines are going to do that, not us. So you can see this image. So this image clearly tells that there is an area where your coronary blood flow will be at its maximum and there is no competing waves. You can see here, there is absolutely no competing waves from other systemic vessels. So that's what we refer to as a wave-free period. And you can extrapolate, this is an experimental data, and you can extrapolate into the simple pulse waveform. So in the pulse waveform, this portion corresponds to what we have uh, experimentally discovered already. That's the wave-free period we're talking about. And during this particular period, if you find out the PD bar PA, that becomes really significant like that of FFR that we have already known. So is there any cutoffs for that? Uh, instantaneous wave free ratio, yes. IFR values of more than 0.94 is considered to be very, sig I mean, non, non significant and you can defer the PCA in this setting. IFR values of less than or equal to 0.86 is considered to be hemodynamically very significant. You can take IFR of less than 0.86 as uh, FFR of less than 0.80 and you have to do a PCA in this setting. Similarly, IFR in the range of 0.86 to 0.94 is a gray zone. So here, whether to do PCA or not depends on your personal expertise or maybe depending on the uh, patient's comorbid conditions, how much uh, risk he's having for future cardiovascular disease or future death because of cardiovascular disease or what is the status of the patient currently, is he very symptomatic. So depending on a lot of other factors, you can do a PCA here or not do a PCA in the same sitting. So what are the trials that have told you that IFR is really significant and uh, what are the basis of these cutoffs as well? So you had three trials for that. One is called the Define Flare Study, which is going to be the most important of all. Then we have the IFR Swedish Heart. It's done in Sweden. That's why it's called a Swedish Heart. And we have an Advice Study, which is a very old one. So it's the first thing to tell about the IFR. But anyways, the Define Flare is the one that clearly defined the utility of IFR in clinical practice in patients where adenosine cannot be used. And after all these things, we have certain indices that can uh, detect the microvascular dysfunction. We know that. So one index we discussed already which can detect the microvascular dysfunction is the IMR. That is index of microvascular resistance. How you're going to find out the microvascular resistance is basically by using a formula that is called as PD multiplied by Transit time, that is nothing but the coronary blood flow. The transit time, if I use that word, it always means coronary blood flow. Transit time during hyperemic states. Which means to find out this IMR, you need to produce hyperemia, which means you need adenosine here also. Fine. So whenever I call transit time, remember, it means uh, simply a coronary blood flow that I am talking about. Because the amount of coronary blood flow will be proportional to the transit time. So by using the transit time of how much time it takes for the blood to move from one area to another area will be proportionally equal to the coronary blood flow. So that can be used as an index of coronary blood flow. So it's nothing but the coronary blood flow that you're talking about. So this is the formula for IMR. IMR is not of that much utility. But anyways, there is another 
thing that is of uh, a little utility that is called a CFR. So what do you mean by the CFR? That is coronary flow reserve. So coronary flow reserve assesses the entire coronary tree. It's not specific for the epicardial vessels nor it's not specific for the microvascular problems. So it's going to assess the entire coronary tree for that matters. So how can you measure the CFR? CFR can be measured through invasive techniques as well as through some non-invasive techniques.